Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's Bible study is entitled Creation or Evolution, Part 1. All right, welcome, uh, good morning. Great attendance for our first study together. Here either to learn or to see me make a fool of myself. Which is it for you, huh? <laughs> maybe a little of both, because probably both is going to happen. We're going to be in Genesis, of course, probably, I'm not sure if we're going to make it through the first seven chapters, we're going to make it through hopefully five, because uh, there is so much there, where we're, you can turn there, we're going to be referencing that, of course, and your knowledge of it here along the way, but really not getting into Genesis so much this morning, as much as stuff we're going to be putting on the screen, we're going to be in actually the New Testament a couple of different places, uh, so, so you can be ready for that. Um, how many, I, I'm sorry, how many, of you, I didn't see the hands, I heard the question, but I never saw the hands. How many is this your first time ever at a, at a Winter Texan Bible study? So, yeah, there you go, all right. So a good bit of you, so welcome. How many of you, not only is this not your first, this is your first time in Winter Texan Bible study, this is your first time to Island Baptist Church, or, or this is your first winter to Island Baptist Church, maybe I should say that. You've maybe been Sunday, you heard it some other way, I don't know, so. Well, we're glad to have you. And uh, privileged to have and minister to so many people from from all over, uh, primarily the Midwest. Do we have anybody further? We have we have Ohio people. I know. Do we have anybody further east than that? We have New Jersey. New, oh, no further east than that. <laughs> Anything north of that? Do we have New Yorkers? Do we have any New Yorkers? New Hampshire's? New, New York City? No, yeah. no. New York State, which is the majority. Okay, way up north. Where the snow? <laughs> Welcome to the world of short pants, and the snow is in your refrigerator. Gosh, y'all got, got nailed recently. Um, what about uh, west of Montana? Anybody west? We have Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California, Nevada. Those people, they don't come here anyway. <laughs> and we have way north. We have how many provinces? We got Alberta, did you say? So, uh, and we have Ontario. Do we have anybody from Ontario? Yes, that's right. Ontario. And we got Yukon and Manitoba. And what other, any other provinces we're missing? So just an illustration of the kind of, uh, there's, and I'm a Texan, and there's not but about six of us in this room, I think. <laughs> one over there, one over there, <laughs> one right there, sort of. So we don't have many of those, so it's a good, we're a good eclectic bunch here. We come from a lot of different backgrounds, uh, some Baptist, some denominations we never heard of, Catholic, Presbyterian, the regular ones, you know, Methodist, uh, Congregationalists, all these things. And so we all gather uh, together, but, but we not, I'm not here to make you a Baptist because I don't, I don't think that's going to do you any good. Uh, but I am here to make you a Biblicist. What does the Bible say? It doesn't matter whether you're a Methodist or Presbyterian or whatever, but if you're not in the Bible, then you're not, I might, forgive me, you're not nothing. Because the scriptures are everything. Uh, we put a name to whatever we go to, and you're going to have to have a name out in the front. I mean, there's, there's nothing you can do about that. Uh, but, but if we're not Bible, we're not anything. We really aren't. And so we're going to gather together uh, under the Word of God. We're going to listen to what it, He has to say to us uh, through that Word. We're going to honor it as, as the Scriptures together. We're going to be studying some things outside the Scriptures, of course, things like evolution and science and other things. Uh, but, but together, we're ultimately going to be determining what does the Bible say? Because if we don't know what the Bible says, then we do not know what God says. And we don't know what God says, then we really don't know where we are. And since we're His creation, and we're going to be, of course, harping on that pretty hard. So... So let's pray together. We're going to begin our Bible study together and uh, invite others to come. They don't have to attend necessarily in person. Uh, we are online. We are uh, live stream right now. There's somebody somewhere posting on Facebook of, or YouTube of what's, what we're doing right now. You can click on that if you're not here. If you have friends that are out in other places, hey, watch Pastor Bill. He's going to be like a fool out of himself. Watch this, you know, kind of thing. Bring them on. So uh, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for uh, just the privilege we have to gather together uh, because of your cause, Lord, because you have called us, uh, because you've given us your word, because you've called us to be faithful to you, God. We ask just for the anointing of your spirit over this place, that you'd fill us each heart here, uh, you'd touch each life, Lord, as only you can. Uh, ultimately, uh, you're the teacher, uh, you're the instructor, 
You're the informer of things that really matter and that are really going on, and Lord, we ask you to open our eyes and deliver us from any misconceptions we have, any deceptions that we have. Lord, that's a constant need that we have every single day, all the way from me to the, to the last person in here who, who just picked up your word. Lord, we, uh, we are deceived people, and we ask God to deliver us from, from that deception. Thank you, God, that you lead us all into truth, uh, and that if you are your she- our shepherd, we can hear your voice, and so we're trusting and believing in that today. Bless our time, bless this, this winter. Thank you for so many from so many states and provinces, God, and just the opportunity we have to uh, fellowship together over your word, uh, to grow together. Thank you so much, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be in Genesis, but we're not going to be, we're not going to be in Genesis 1 until all the way to the end. If when you hear in Genesis 1, you know that you can close your Bible because we're going to be over. We're going to be all over the place today, and we're going to be pursuing together in these eight studies, these eight Tuesdays together, some very important conclusions that I think we have to deal with as Christians if we're going to do what God's called us to do, be the support and pillar of the truth. So how can you support the truth if you don't know what it is? And if you're walking around the truth and not really supporting the truth, then how can we really say we're functioning as a church? And so it's incredibly important, these conclusions we're going to be drawing together. And I will say as a disclaimer, because we are going to be dealing with some things that have to do with science. I do have a science degree. I have, I have more theological degrees than I have science degrees. But I have a, I have a biology degree, which qualifies me for almost nothing. Um, <laughs> that I'm not a scientist, and nor do I play one on television. And, uh, but I am a Bible teacher. And I am a studier and a lover of the Word of God, and I do intend to teach you uh, what it says. I do not intend to to instruct you on how you should believe. I I will tell you how I think you should believe, but ultimately that decision is going to have to be yours. Uh, We're going to be addressing some scientific things, like I said, that need to be put out there because, and and, uh, when you hear good stuff from me, you know it did not come from me because I already told you I'm not a scientist, but I am real, real, I, I have enough sense to do some good research, and so the people I'll be quoting to you, coming referencing to you, are, are great people and solid people that you can trust, I believe. So as I state things like that, just know where it comes from, but let me just say this with regards to science. Don't be intimidated by science. Part, part of the power of the deception, if, if we could say that about what isn't science anymore, uh, there is a lot of good science out there, I'm not saying that there isn't, but there's a lot that isn't. And part of the deception is foisted upon us by by just simple the intimidation of you're not smart enough to know this stuff. And I just want to give you the power to know that you are. Science isn't isn't the realm of not knowing stuff. In fact, science is the opposite of that. Science is knowledge. That's what it is. Do you have knowledge? Do you have knowledge? What is that knowledge based on? Something you saw? Something you can demonstrate to me? That's what science is. It's no more complicated than that. Science is just simply the knowledge of things, and seeking the knowledge of things. You don't have to be a scientist to know things. For instance, 2 plus 2 equals... What is it in Canada? <laughs> Same thing. Isn't that amazing? So did y'all know I, this, they have Christmas on the same day that we do up there? You know that? <laughs> they don't have Thanksgiving on the same day. Now, 2 plus 2 is 4 because, well, actually, math is a part of science. It's, 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 a, it's a field of science, and, and it's actually a good demonstration of science because it doesn't matter what language we're in. It doesn't matter uh, what culture we're in. It doesn't matter what time of year we are. 2 plus 2 always equals 4. It never equals 5. It never equals 3. It's, it's observable. It's repeatable. Science isn't complicated. Now, there's some complicated things about science. Nancy, all of yours are, are over there. I, I, you're welcome to come in here, sister, all the way to the front. I'll, I'll let you have a seat, but all yours are over there. <laughs> There's a, another Canadian, but she's a member of the church now, so she's an American now. We've, that's the way you become an American, is you join the church. <laughs> Don't be intimidated by science. Uh, to be scientific, it has to be two things. Observable. Can you see it? Can you repeat it? So you saw it, but you can't repeat it to me, then it's technically not science. Now, I'm free to believe what you say, and there's nothing wrong with believing stuff. But we can't collectively call it, for me, it's not science, because you couldn't repeat it to me. And technically speaking, it's not. It has to be those two things. It has to be observable, and it has to be repeatable. Observation is a part of science. How do you know things? Most of the stuff that you know, you observed. You saw. You were told 2 plus 2 equals 4, but now, you know, you had two chickens and you had two more chickens, you wound up with four chickens. Hi, I observed. There it is. That's 
very simple, but in fact it is science. To be science, it has to be both observable and repeatable, which eliminates, by the way, faith. Faith is not science. The Bible is not a science book. I will say this, as far as my knowledge is concerned, every time that the Bible has touched on anything scientific, it has been 100% accurate. But the Bible is, in no way intends or puts itself out there to be a science book. It is a faith book. It is teaching about someone who you cannot observe and who you cannot re bring into presence of you. I, I met God. Let me introduce you to him. You can't observe it and you can't repeat it. It is definitely not science. In fact, the Bible comes straight out and, and goes, goes the opposite direction. Here's Hebrews 11.1, 1, right? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, by definition, not science. Not science. Don't try to make faith science. It never will be. It never will be. It's, it's as we're going to see in just a second, it has to do with the supernatural. And the supernatural, by definition, is not natural. If it's not natural, it's not observable. If it's not natural, it's not repeatable, and therefore it's not science. So, so you can drop that one, but here's the thing, and I will say this, no, nowhere in, the, in our study will I be proving to you that God created the earth in six consecutive 24-hour days. If you came for that reason, you can just go, because I'm not going to be able to do it, neither can anybody else. Because the fact that God created in six 24-hour consecutive days is neither observable nor repeatable. It's not science. Either you believe it, or you do not. And God offers you no alternative. There is not an alternative. Because it is supernatural, therefore not natural, therefore not observable, and not repeatable. I did, do intend to prove to you that the Bible does clearly teach that God created in six 24-hour consecutive days and that you cannot say that you believe the Scriptures and at the same time say that you don't believe in a six-day creation. You can't say that. You can't say that. I, I shouldn't say that. You, you can say that. You're just not honest when you say that. I do intend to prove that to you. And I also intend to prove to you, uh, listen carefully, that evolution is not science. For the same reasons that creation is not science. It isn't science because, just like the Bible, just like creation, it's neither observable nor repeatable. Have you ever seen anything evolve? You never will. You go out on the beach and wait for a long time for a creature to crawl up on the ocean with fins and then evolve into something with feet. It is not observable. It is not repeatable. By definition, listen, it's critical you understand this, it is not science. Now, it is, it is, in fact, it is very similar to creation. It's a belief system. Many, 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 many people, maybe people in this room, you're free to believe whatever you want to, believe that evolution is true. So I want to separate between the two of those. What I believe and what is science can never mix. Because if I can observe it, then I have no longer reason to believe it anymore. You follow me? Because I've seen it, and I can demonstrate it to you. I believe in a six-day, six 24-hour creation, consecutive-day creation. I, I believe it, but I cannot prove it to you. No one can. Likewise, there are many people who believe at, with all their hearts that evolution is true, and they have complete freedom to do that, but, but they cannot prove it to you because it has never been observable or repeatable. What evolution is, is taking the evidence, fossil evidence, the geological evidence, and other things, and forming a belief system about what they see. That's all that it is. It is a belief system. It is a faith system. Not, like I said, not too dissimilar. I already have a faith system myself. So not the only reason why I don't go with evolution, but that is all that it is. Anytime anyone asks you to believe something or tells you what they believe, you can know that science has ceased. I don't care who she is or who he is. They may be scientists themselves. Nothing wrong with a scientist believing stuff, is there? I mean, isn't that the way we've come into good science? They believe something could be true, and they pursue that, and we actually find a, a scientific answer because it's now observable and repeatable. They believed it was true at once. They couldn't prove it. And then when they found the evidence, and they could demonstrate it to others, and it could go through scientific tests, and now we have all kinds of things that are, that are very good science. Nothing wrong with that. But anytime they've asked you to just believe something, you no longer have science because science has, is not belief. 
It is observable. It has to be observable and repeatable. They saw it, but they can't demonstrate it to you. They're just asking you to believe it. They believe it with all their hearts, and they have all kinds of letters after their name. It, it's still just a faith system. It's still just a faith system. Do not be intimidated by that. Nothing wrong with science. Nothing wrong with faith. They do not mix. They cannot mix. As soon as you mix them, one or the other ceases to be. So again, not that scientists can't believe stuff. Evolution has never been proven, scientifically. Did you know that? Like I said, it's put out there like it has been, but it has not been. It's put out there as facts. Again, they have facts, and then they have things that they believe about those facts, and the things they believe about those facts are not actually facts. You have facts. I mean, we have the same facts. You have the same geological table. You have the same fossils. You have all these things. You have the same uh, things that we can measure, which is, by the way, scientific. It's observable. It's repeatable, right? But, but evolution has never been proven scientifically, in my opinion, never will be. Because, again, like I've said, it's a faith system. And the missing links that they believe existed, they're still missing. And I know you think your husband may be the one. He's not. <laughs> He's not the missing link. He acts like it sometimes. <laughs> but, but the proof of evolution has been pursued with extreme bias in the Western culture for 150, more than 150 years. And with, I mean, incredible amounts of money, careers and millions of dollars have been staked on it, proving it to be true scientifically, but we still have nothing. And what do I mean by biased? I mean just simply this. Their, their pursuit was not to find out the truth. Their pursuit was to just simply prove something they already believed to be true, which was evolution. There's a difference. That's not science. That's, that's, that, by the way, that's the way a lot of science starts, though, isn't it? I, I believe this is true, and I pursue a proof of this, but we've been 150 years in this with throwing a lot of money at it and a lot of smart people and we still have no proof. Like I said, I would submit to you, given that record, it's never going to be proven. Send someone out to prove evolution is true, to find the missing links, to find evidence of the evolutionary process, which they believe to be true, and they're welcome to believe whatever they want. And we fund this project with millions of dollars and promise millions to the person who finds these missing links, in addition to fame and fortune, and uh, in addition to that, getting that this unknown creature being named after them, which in science culture is so, supposed to be a really big deal. I had a, the only teacher I ever had in college who was part of our, she was our, our professor in invertebrate zoology, who had a, she had a sea worm named after her. I got a C in her class. She was tough. You ever have a professor that has some kind of invertebrate named after him? Drop the course, just my... <laughs> Drop it right there. <laughs> so they fund this project with millions of dollars, and they put millions behind it, and now they have millions of dollars, not to mention reputations at stake, that uh, in order to produce evidence. So, so reason with me. Have you ever heard the, the phrase, follow the money? Follow the money, and you'll find out what's really going on. So now they have, listen, millions of reasons, because if you don't find the link... Guess what? You don't get the money. So now, now I've, I've enabled this person with millions of reasons to find an answer. So guess what he does? Well, A, he doesn't find the answer and he gives up on millions of bucks and worldwide fame. Or B, he manufactures an answer because who's going to find out? He's counting on the fact that you think you're dumb enough not to figure it out when in fact you're not that dumb. But so, so what happened was these millions of reasons, they find a link because, hey, <laughs> you know, you got to find one for that kind of money. And then, in, and then not until years later is the public, uh, who've been duped all along about this false evidence, or have, has it been demonstrated that these links were actually a fraud? Uh, a, a reference for you. Here's a great book. I, I not read the whole thing. I've just read excerpts from it. Uh, Jerry Bergman's Evolutions, Blunders, Frauds, and Forgeries. You can buy it on Amazon. It's available right now. I think it's 12 bucks, 15 bucks. Read that book. Find, like I said, it's, it's, it's not stuff that you can't know. You need to hear what's been happening. Again, all the while, with no proof, saying we have all the proof. 
all the while saying it's scientific, when in fact, it's just a belief system. And they're welcome to believe whatever they want, but they're not welcome to call what they believe science, because in fact, it's not. So after hundreds of scientists staking their reputations, they wrote thousands of papers and books, and backed by millions of dollars to prove that evolution is true, this is what we now have. Through unknown chemicals in a primordial past that work through unknown processes which no longer exist but nevertheless could produce unknown life forms which are not to be found but could, through unknown reproduction methods, spawn new life in an unknown atmospheric composition, an unknown oceanic soup, at an unknown time and place. That's evolution. They're asking you to believe it. They believe it. It's, it's a, it you're free to believe that. You're, you're free to b believe that. It's called a theory. But I, I would suggest to you, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this point later, but that it's, that it's not a theory because it's not plausible. Theories are theories when you have some plausibility. I, you know, I could see how possibly they're going to work out. Evolution can't work. It just simply can't. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that to you. I, I, I'll demonstrate it to me. It may not make any sense to you, but we'll find out. But, but back, back to math, as simple as math is, here's the evolutionary equation. Nobody times nothing equals everything. That is not science. That is a belief system. That is a faith system. It takes a lot of faith to believe that's true. That's their equation, because that's what they have. They don't have anything else. That is not science, yet we still indoctrinated that evolution as to be factual. It, is that facts? Well, that actually is facts. That is the facts about evolution. But it doesn't result in anything factual. You either believe it or you don't. That, that's what it boils down to. Nothing else. And much to the chagrin of evolutionists and the natural sciences, as they're so-called, uh, evolution requires us to believe in the supernatural. They really do. We're going to see this, make sure you're here for the third study, we're going to be looking at a thing called entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. In order for evolution to work, if it, to have a prayer, it has to reverse what we know to be absolute laws. The reason why these laws are absolute, the laws of thermodynamics, the reason why they call them laws is because there's no exceptions to them. Entropy is what's happening to your house where, wherever you're from right now. It's snowing. It, so, so you left it clean. Do y'all leave the house clean? That's the, see, it's dirty. That's the reason why I leave my house. <laughs> Get out of there. So you leave it clean, you leave it straight, you drain the water pipes, I hope you did, it's cold's not over, you have somebody checking on your house, maybe some of you have, if you do, a remote you know, way to look on your phone and tell what temperature it is inside your house, do you have that with a thermostat? Some of you have people checking on, clearing your driveways and doing things like that. The house isn't getting better, though, is it? If, it, if, if you're lucky, it stays the same. But if you do nothing to it at all, it will go like this. That's entropy. We all know entropy because that's what happens to stuff. It, stuff doesn't go this way. It goes that way. It doesn't get better. It naturally, I should say, it naturally gets worse. If you just leave it alone, it falls apart. But to get it to get better, you have to push it uphill. It, it's, it's a constant thing. You constantly are cleaning. You're constantly fixing. You're constantly uh, managing. The same is true with your physical bodies. You're, you're, are you better than you were when you were 18? We don't get prettier, do we? Don't get thinner. Don't get more hair. Some cases don't get very don't get smarter either, do we? Because of a thing called entropy, the Bible calls it the curse. We're going to be looking at that here in the third the third time we're together. Uh, the curse is an, is is an absolute. It, the law of second law of thermodynamics is an absolute. For evolution to work, it requires you to believe in something supernatural. That these natural laws, which are which are there are no exceptions to them. There, are, there were exceptions, in fact, not just one exception, millions upon millions upon millions of exceptions. So, so actually, science, if you're just going to look at science in the strict sense, which is what I would suggest you do, science says there is no such thing as evolution. No such thing. Because it requires you to believe in the supernatural, which science is only based on the natural, the laws of nature, which are, are observable and repeatable, have to be suspended for the process of evolution to take place. By the way, that's exactly what the Bible describes as supernatural. Why can't we prove that God created in six 24-hour consecutive days? Because it was supernatural. Don't look for evidence of the supernatural inside of the natural. That makes no sense. That's not where it happens. 
It happens outside. It, uh, uh, supernatural is above that which is natural. So evolution is asking you to believe in the supernatural. Something that doesn't normally happen in nature actually happened. Like I said, it's really apples to apples. We're going to talk about creation and evolution. It's apples to apples. It's not science and faith. It's two faith systems, two beliefs. Neither can be proven. Which is, by the way, like I said, the reason why evolution cannot be proven because supernatural can never be science. It cannot be. It's not observable. Not repeatable. Evolution can't be proven. So we're left with two belief systems that require us to believe in the supernatural. And I do not have any way, in any way, I want, to think, I want you to think I'm an expert in evolution. I, have, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I know more than you do at this point because I study. <laughs> but I am, I will say clearly, pursuing expertise in the scriptures. And I have been for a long time. And I can tell you with an expertise in the scriptures that if you do not believe the first seven chapters of the Bible are true and literal, then you have no way of saying that any other part of the scripture is true or literal. You have completely undermined your faith. That, that's a choice you're going to have to make. So if you have a problem with the first seven chapters of the Bible, you have a problem with the rest of the scriptures. You have no basis whatsoever to say that any of it's trustworthy, if you cannot trust the first seven chapters, and in particular the first two, if you can't. And I, like I said, that's, that's an issue you're going to have to deal with. Genesis is foundational to the rest of the Bible. If chapters 1 and 2 uh, do not tell the truth, then why should we believe any other? You can't come up with an answer. Your, your, your argument will be flawed. Genesis is referred to both in the Old and New Testament more times than any other book. Jesus refers to the book of Genesis multiple times, including the flood and the creation of Adam and Eve, never indicating in any way that they're anything other than literal or accurate. So I want you to understand that you're welcome to believe whatever you want to. You're pitting yourself, though, if you don't believe the Genesis epic story. You're pitting yourself against the likes of Jesus, who in no way claimed, in any way indicated that they were not reliable. Let's, let's go to a couple of places just to consider... Uh, how Jesus handled the Old Testament, in particular the writings of Moses, in particular the book of Genesis. So turn with me to the book of uh, John, chapter 5. And we could read the end of it, but I want us to read just sort of the whole, the whole passage, really, because it's, it's, uh, I, think, I think it's just, it puts it into context so we can kind of see what Jesus is dealing with here. He's dealing with a faith system that is contrary to the biblical faith. He's dealing with a group of men and women who are contrary. We know them as Pharisees and scribes, right? They're contrary because their conclusions, they didn't, they didn't believe what God had to say. And that's, again, your option. Jesus is dealing with people just like that. And he uses, in particular, the writing of Moses as an example of that. Verse 15, John 5. The men went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. This is the guy that Jesus healed. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath day. And he answered them, As my father was working until now, and I myself am working. For this cause, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling himself, calling God his father, making himself equal to God. So you never have to worry about the Pharisees. If you're not really sure what Jesus is saying, the Pharisees will come along and, and help you see. They... If you blunder, they, they're going to make a bigger blunder and, and help you understand. They'll go by going the wrong direction. Jesus therefore answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows himself all things that he himself is doing, and greater works than these uh, will he show him that you may marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life even to uh, the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given judgment to the Son, in order that, he may, that, the honor, that all may honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. That's a pretty clear statement, right? So you got people who got a problem with Jesus, and they all love, they're all about God. It's like, no, you're not. No, you're not. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in Him who sent me has eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear shall live. 
For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in their tombs shall hear the voice and shall come forth, those who did good deeds to the resurrection of, the, of life and those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative. He's repeating this again. I, as I hear, I judge, and, as, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness of my testimony, my testimony is not true. Now he's getting into where is his, the, the basis of who he is. Uh, the, 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 the basis of uh, the logical basis of his ministry, if you will. There is another who hears witness of me, and I know that the testimony which he bears is true, of me is true. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. But the witness which I receive is not from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He has. He has the lamp that was burning. He was a lamp that was burning and was shining and was willing, and you were willing to rejoice in, in his, while, while you had his light. But the witness which I have is greater than that of John, for the works which the Father has sent me to accomplish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, and the Father has sent me, and the Father has sent me. So these are the basis of his ministry. He said, I'm, I'm doing what the Father told me to do. And the Father uh, who sent me has borne witness of me, and you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Because like I said, God's not observable. And he's not repeatable. You have to believe it. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. By the way, this would have been very, very confrontational for them because they thought they believed the scriptures. But notice he's going to line out for them. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is these that bear witness of me. Which scriptures? Which ones? What is he referring to in this point? Was the, old, was the New Testament written at this point? He's referring to the Old Testament. We have a very low estimate of what the Old Testament really is. Jesus didn't. I would suggest to you that you need to get on level with Jesus. You search the Scriptures because you think, and in them you have eternal life, and these bear witness of me, and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life, and I do not receive glory from men. But I know you that you do not know, have the love of God in yourselves, and I come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another? And you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is who? What's he talking about? In whom you have set your hope. Moses wrote what books in the Bible? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Called it the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Moses is responsible. So he's referring, among other things, to the book of Genesis. Notice what he says here. For if you had believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. We're going to see this in chapter 3 of Genesis. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Again, the basis of Jesus', the, the logical basis of Jesus' ministry is what God had already said. No way indicated in any way it was anything other than accurate or literal. So the whole basis of what I'm doing is something that God's already said to you. And because you didn't believe it, that's why you can't believe. So it, it's not a nothing. It's not a nothing to, to say, oh, well, I'm not really sure about the first three chapters. Oh, well, oh, it's a something for sure. How important is the issue of evolution versus creation? It's as important as the question of, is there a God? That's a big, that's a biggie. It's that important. The... the Genesis tells us that God is our creator, and the New Testament tells us that our creator is also our redeemer. Consider Colossians 1. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the, of, of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Jesus is our redeemer. The forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of, over all creation. For by him all things were created. The same one who redeems us is the one who created us. That are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities. So not just, not just things that you can see, tangible things, scientific things, but unscientific, supernatural things. Principalities, powers, all things are created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. They hold together. So, so if you don't believe he's your creator, you, you have no basis to say that he's your redeemer. I have people that are all about Jesus being their Savior, 
but they're not sure about the whole creation thing. I'm telling you, that's a huge mistake. You're undermining your faith. Either you believe what it says or you don't. And you're going to have to believe it because it, it can't be proven. It cannot. So, so it, it is important to question as a question of is there a God, this, this argument between evolution and creation. It's as important as the question of is there morality? Is there? Is there things that are right? Truly right? And things that are truly wrong? Or is it all relative? It's just how you feel today. I don't feel good today, so I'm going to go down to the post office and shoot it up. Is that right or wrong? It's as impo- that's an important question, don't you think? The, the question of evolution versus creation is, that is, is just that. If evolution is true, then we're all biological accidents who emerge by chance, and there is no right or wrong. I can do whatever I want. So can you. Total chaos. Uh, situational ethics, as they call them. Uh, anarchy. If evolution is true, then humans are just animals. And aborting unwanted cats is no different than aborting unwanted children. By the way, that's where we are today. Some places in the United States, you can be arrested and or fined for aborting cats. But you can abort your child. Government pay for it. That is messed up. That is what evolution has done to us. That That is, honestly, that's evolutionary thinking. But if you have a problem with that, but on the other hand, are holding to evolution, I'm just telling you, you know, you're washed up. Your, your argument is extremely flawed. It's either one or the other. If evolution is true and we're here by chance, then, then there's no moral distinction between me running you over out here in the parking lot and me swatting a fly when I get home. Hey, you're just creatures. You just happen to be ahead of the fly in the evolutionary process. It's as, it's as important as a question of are there morals. See, I have a question for evolutionists. Here's my question. Why don't they believe their own, follow their own stuff? Because here's, here's what an evolutionist should do. To be consistent with his beliefs, if you're an evolutionist, and I want you to think about this, he should make it his personal goal to shut down all hospitals, stop all medications, and allow the weak to simply die. Because that is what's best for the survival of our species. Is it not? The survival of the fittest, if that's what an evolution is all about that. And why don't you believe and follow your own stuff if you're an evolutionist? That's just my question. Prolonging life, prolonging life medically for the genetically less endowed works against the survival of the fittest. For example, why will we pursue the cure for AIDS, for instance? If the evolution is true, then AIDS is just the way nature is selecting against those who are uh, engaged in IV drug use or unnatural or unmonogamous sex. It's just the way nature is selecting against it. Let it run! And let them die. And here's a bigger question, maybe more important for us today. Why would we pursue an answer to the question of how do we stop this coronavirus? Isn't it true that it's just simply nature's way, if evolution is true, of selecting against those who have poor immune systems or comorbidities? Wouldn't it be better for us as a species just to let those kind of people die? Does that make sense to you? It should make sense to the evolutionists because that is the point. If evolution is true, you can't have it two ways. You know, one of the problems I have with evolution is, is they claim they're, they're intellectual, but at the same time they're not really thinking. I would like to, in evolution to explain to me how we evolved a conscience to begin with. Not would that bother? It shouldn't bother any of us. And, and, and let me say this. Hats off to Hitler and the Third Reich and the Nazis because they took it to its natural conclusions. They, without a conscience killed, maimed, tortured those who they deemed less evolved. That is evolution. They were taking what Darwin had written to its honest conclusions. I'm appalled at that, right? Well, you should be. Like I said, it's an important question. It's not just a question of, ah, well, where do you fall in this whole issue of evolution? No, it's it's a huge question. It's huge. They were into the survival of the fittest. They believed they were the fittest, and they proved they were proving it as they were murdering people destroying all kinds, not just Jews, but all kinds of people. Evolution, listen, strikes at the base of Christianity. All Christian doctrines have their basis in Genesis, in particular the first three chapters. So if the first three chapters are true, aren't true, then you have no basis for marriage, no basis for sin, no basis for judgment, no basis for death, 
No basis for wearing clothes. Why do we wear clothes? No animals do. Seven-day week? Why aren't there eight-day weeks? I'm in Canada, you know, they're going to have Thanksgiving another day. Might as well have eight, eight days up there, right? <laughs> no, it's going to be seven. Why is it universal? Why is that true? Cultures that have never heard of the Scriptures. Why do we have seven days and not eight days, not five days? Why do we have morality? Why do we have rules? Why do Satan, the gospel, all these things are the seedbed of this is the first three chapters. And if you pull up the first three chapters, you have no basis for any of these doctrines. They just, end of the wind, gone. So we have two options with regards to Genesis, and this is what we're going to be pursuing in our, in our uh, time together in the next uh, two months. Two options. Either instead of, in, in, either we believe, well, here's the two options. Either you believe it or you don't. It's just simple. Do you believe it? Do you not believe it? Do you take it for what it says, or do you not? Be honest with yourself. Don't, don't try to ride a fence. There's not a fence to ride. They're, they're, instead of the nobody times nothing equals everything, here's the divine equation. This is the divine equation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Either you believe it or you don't. That won't be proven this to you, because it's not observable. It's not repeatable. You will either believe it, or you do not. But if you do not, you have no basis for believing anything else the Scripture has to say. You just need to know that. So the Scripture sets itself up as this indivisible structure, this, this document, this communication system. And if one part unravels, so does the rest of it. You're not free to make a quilt out of the take pieces here and a piece here and sew it together and take the part out of the middle you don't like. You're not free to do that. Well, you're free to do whatever you want, but you can't do it at the same time and, and claim honesty and intellectual honesty because you're not being honest with it. You just say you don't believe it. That's fine. That's, that's your business. I don't recommend that. But just say you don't believe it. Either believe that God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, or you do not. I have nothing else to offer you. And if you do believe that God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, then all you have left, the only explanation you have is Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 2. Take it or leave it. That's, that's what you've got. Take it or leave it. Quit trying to make science out of it, because it can't be science. It is a faith. You either believe it or you don't. And it, it is, if you do not, then you, you have no basis to believe what the rest of the Bible says. And you need to stop saying that you believe the Bible. You can't say you believe the Bible on the one hand and turn around and say, demonstrate that you don't believe the Bible on the other hand, that's being dishonest. Don't do that. So we're going to stop. Because the stuff I'm going to get into next is going to be, takes the whole chapter of Genesis. And uh, because, because I want you to come back next time, because I want to have some things that are going to disturb you, maybe. <laughs> so, I, and I'm going to be accepting questions for those who haven't been here before. The rest of you know that I do. But I'm going to only be accepting the questions that I can answer that make me look good. So be sure... <laughs> No, I don't mind telling you I don't know stuff. <laughs> question. Somebody got a question. We're going to be making our way from first and second chapters uh, next time, the majority of those two. And then the third time we're going to be in Genesis 3, which is the basis of sin, the basis of a lot of things that you know to be true. Our, our whole world is, is dominated by sin, the results of sin that we call the curse. Like I said, the, the, laws of the law of entropy is very, very powerful. Uh, absolutely uh, without exception law. And you're familiar with it. Again, most of the things that are scientific, you know them because you can observe. You're not dumb. You're, you're smart. And there may be people smarter than you in certain areas, but in general, you've made it this far. You've not made it this far because you were an idiot. You made it this far because you're not an idiot. And just because you've got letters after your name doesn't, doesn't, make, doesn't, doesn't mean you're smart. It means you know certain things but, but everybody, including me, is biased. Oh, we're biased because we're Bible believers. Oh, for sure. But the scientists aren't biased. Oh, now you're smoking the good stuff. <laughs> well, I'm telling you right now, they're the same as you. They're human beings. They're biased. They're, they're moved by emotion and by circumstances they're products of their history and their 
background. They, as much as they try, cannot remove themselves from the process. It's very, very hard. So it, it's, it's impossible to come up with something that's without bias. The, the only way to do it is what they call a double-blind test. And the double-blind test, the evolutionists don't do. So, for instance, here's, here's a double-blind test since we're talking about, uh, and we're going to be getting, by the way, we're going to talk about radiometric dating. We have a, I'm going to be asking you for approval. We have a nuclear scientist in here. He can tell you stuff. He's smarter than me. We'll let him. He's forgotten more, I should say, than, than, I've, than I've learned. But anyway, so, so uh, for instance, the Shroud of Turin. You heard of the Shroud of Turin? You know, it is supposedly the burial cloth of Christ. They've been trying to prove for a long time, and, and so they did radiometric dating on it, uh, carbon-14 dating on it to see how old it was, and they clipped a piece, a small piece, out of it. Of course, the, the, the cloth is brown. And they were going to do what's called a double-blind test, which means you sent other pieces of cloth in with this cloth, and they were going to test all of them, and, uh, but you wouldn't know which one was the Shroud of Turin. The problem, the problem with it was is that it wasn't blind. You sent him one piece of cloth that's brown, and five pieces of cloth that are stark white. So <laughs> the tester knows it's not, bi it's not unbiased. They were all white or all brown. Well, then, you, then, 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 it's in, then it's impossible for the tester, no matter what he does or she does, to have a bias because then, you know, he doesn't know which one is which. But if you've got one brown and five white ones, one's just like, Pfft. And that is a great example. By the way, that was some of us people trying to prove how old our stuff is. Talking about, we're going to talk about scientists and religion and stuff. That was the religionists trying to prove how old this shroud was. Because they really didn't want it to say anything other than what they wanted it to say. That it was 2,000 years old. And again, that's not science. Science is whatever the results are is what the results are. Whatever the answer is, that's what the end. If it disagrees with what I thought or what I, my whole premise or my, my million dollars of backing, then oh well, that's science. Hardly ever do we get real science. It's real, real hard. Because why? Because people are dishonest. People are liars. Money talks. It's just the world we live in. I know this is nothing new to you. You know that. It's not, there's, no, there's no section of our existence that is immune to that. So just remember that. When you, when you come across those that call themselves scientists, they're just like you. They're just sinners. Yeah. Hopefully saved by grace. I hope. So, question. God is, <clears throat> God is infinite. So time does not exist for him. Time does not exist for God. That's exactly right. No, it does exist for him. He's just not under... God created time, sunrise, sunset. Are you wrong in thinking that? No, I guess I'm not right, because he knew he was going to create a being that needed time. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and time, time is relative only for those who don't exist forever. And that's us. It only matters to us. It doesn't matter. God's outside of the space-time continuum. It doesn't affect him. That's why he can call the past, the same as the present, the same as the future, because time is, we're in, a, we're in a linear progression of that. So I'm not, I'm not in the future because I'm in the present, and I'm not in the past because I'm, you know, in the present. But God is over, super, super, super over that, and uh, so it doesn't affect him. Time doesn't affect him, no. It's a question. Yes, sir. Are these questions posted online? They're going to be posted online. Uh, you can connect with us through Island Baptist Church, South Padre Island YouTube channel. Island Baptist Church, South Padre Island. If you're not a friend with us on Facebook, you look up Island Baptist Church, South Padre Island, and you can be connected with us. That's where most of our sermons are live feed through that. Sermons, uh, Bible studies, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, pertinent announcements that come through our church. We would love for you to be connected with us. You're connected with us all, you know, most of you all winter long. And so we would love for you just to be uh, connected with us through that. I know a lot of you watch us online have, have been saying to me, you know, we've been watching you, we're keeping up with you, and so I really appreciate it. We really appreciate that. We hope that what we have for you is something that's going to be beneficial, not just to uh, the locals. It's to beneficial to everybody. So God's bringing you here. And so, you know, we intend to make the most out of that. And so, something else? It's all good. I want you to think about things that are observable and repeatable. <laughs> things that you can see. Things that you can take me to that I didn't see, but I can see it with you. Those are the things that are science. The things that you believe never, never are science until, until they, and by the way, until you can cease to believe them, until you can prove them.
So remember that. Most, most, of every, most everything that is called evolution is not science. They believe it. Free to do that. Absolutely. They, they believe that they've got enough evidence, science, that's science, the things that they observe and can repeat. To, they, they believe they've got enough evidence to believe the extrapolation, which is science, which is evolution. This over here is not science. It's a belief system. It has been a belief system for over 150 years. It has never been proven. Like I said, I submit to you, it never will be proven. Okay? Good to go? Shall we pray? God, we thank you so much that you lead us into all truth, just like Jesus said, you are the truth. Your word is the truth. You've sent your son, Jesus, to communicate to us the truth, and you've given us the Holy Spirit to direct our feet. Lord, we're asking you to do that. Help us, God, to understand. Help us to see through uh, the fog of deception that this world uh, presents to us. Lord, we know uh, that there really is a devil. There really is deception out there, and we are all... Uh, in relation to him, we're all sheep, and we're all in great danger. So, Lord, we pray that you would deliver us from his deceptions and his lies and deliver us over, help us to listen to your voice and no one else's. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.